We are The God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination nor organization whatsoever. We read the Word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. This all began to unravel for us when we began deeper research into the Qumran community of all things, proving that John the Baptist lived there. Messiah visited there and was even baptized there, and that was John's library and where he operated. Then, this insane claim with absolutely zero actual support from facts, nor archaeology, which actually their scene is elsewhere, thus disproven to be Qumran, that somehow Essenes lived in Qumran. Kabbalists, because that's what Essenes are. And this was their library. Again, that's one of the most deceptive and irresponsible pieces of so-called scholarship in modern times. And yes, we have every right to attack that so, because we prove that is a false narrative from the beginning. Now, we nail that down in our original canon series, and we started moving into part three, where would we would expose the Essenes completely. And the trail was so well documented. I mean, what we hit was overwhelming. And this was a year ago. This is so incredibly obvious, yet so obscured from what is being taught, especially in the church generally today. We pulled back from the series and first decided to answer the big question, who is Israel, true Israel, and where are they today? We have now fully satisfied that at this point in this Lost Tribe series. We even began testing the Jews to see if they fit, and they have failed the test of prophecy, as they do not fit, even with contrived attempts. The migration patterns are way off and they actually have genetic disorders in large numbers that make them somewhat immune to some of the actual curses which the three areas Scripture identifies as lost tribe migrations all fit every curse 100%, all three lands, not just Africa, by the way. Now, we systematically break down the synagogue of Satan who say they are Yahudim, again, the word Jew is not ancient Hebrew, nor Greek, nor Aramaic, nor Latin, and even the other three languages they claim it goes through etymologically somehow to get to the word Jew. It's just a fraudulent attempt to connect a word that is not ever one referencing Yah's people as the short for Yahudim, the Hebrew word, would be Yahs, never Jews. We showed you the Assyrians are the replacements of the northern tribes of Israel, who all were taken out of their own land into Assyria, modern Kurdistan. And none returned there, back to Israel. None. Those replacements continued to chip away at Judea all along. We identified Hasmoneans as one faction. And that goes in a direction we have never seen anyone follow through on, but it's right there for all to see, as you have likely seen at this point. One huge question, though. If the Hasmoneans were those fighting Hellenism, you know, the Greek pagan religion, why do they not only bear the symbols of Hellenism, of that same exact paganism on their coins. But they even have Hellenistic names. That certainly isn't demonstrating with their actions that they are the righteous priests who just want everyone to serve Yahuwah and not sin and follow the commandments. Does it? Talk about a false narrative. This is why we have to judge by their fruits, not what they say or even what the contrived history 
of the book of Maccabees may say, which we've already disproven, not only the history, but the legitimacy of Maccabees as scripture. No way, no how is that scripture ever. Now, we proved that in the last video, so if you haven't seen it, go back and watch. But just as Yahushua described with Pharisee 11, their religion is actually against Scripture, against His commandments, just as we see here. Imagine that. Now, we will discuss the rest of the Assyrians in which some become the Pharisees and Sadducees, in fact. Could this really be the case? Or are we just crazy? Well, check this out and see for yourself. We left off with the mapping of Israel's enemies, which will attack its people and take over the temple. And we identified the Maccabean Revolt, which began approximately 167 BC. And look at this. Guess who else was formed in 167 BC? Oh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, both, which were brand new orders in Judea, introduced at the same exact time as the Hasmonean Revolt or Maccabean Revolt. Imagine that. And here are all the Old Testament references to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Wait for it. That's right. There are none, not one. Someone may say, well, the Sanhedrin, which is a council, is mentioned in the Old Testament. That is true, but it was never made up of Pharisees and Sadducees until after 167 B.C. So, no, you don't take its history before it was hijacked by the Pharisees and Sadducees and then insert these two parties that did not exist in Judea in those times, period. Oh, and by the way, those supposed scholars who then claim the Book of Jubilees was written by a Pharisee in 200 B.C. don't even know their history because there were no Pharisees in Jerusalem until 167 B.C. 167 is after 200 B.C., whether alone seizing control to the point where they wrote new texts already doesn't make sense. This is because Jubilees was written by Moses, not a Pharisee. And we will vet that fully in the original canon series. Coming very soon, we have been working on that for some time. 2 Kings 17 gives us a full account of the history. Until the Lord, Yahuwah, removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land of, or to Assyria unto this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sefer Vaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria, instead of, in place of, the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. See, Samaria is the northern kingdom of Israel, on which all were taken. So again, all ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel were replaced, according to Scripture. This is why they did not, nor could they, return to that land. These are the enemies of Israel, and they were not welcome. Psalm 83 reaffirms this as well. Some try to send a fragment here or there, always out of context, to disprove this, but none holds up to the test of Scripture. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling that they who is they? The replacements of Israel. Israel is gone, and only Judea is left, according to Scripture. 
feared not the Lord, Yahuwah. Therefore the Lord, Yahuwah, sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spoke to the king of Assyria. So they still remained under the authority of Assyria, Persia. Remember that. Saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, from Samaria, and let them go and dwell there. So he's talking about an Israelite priest from the northern kingdom, a Levite. One of them. Not several, just one. This is one of the priests. See that? And let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel. Again, how many? One. Just one. And taught them how they should fear the Lord, Yahuwah. Now, what are they doing here? They are infusing the worship of Yahuwah for self-preservation purposes, not in sincerity, but into their pagan religion. We'll show you it confirms that over and over in this passage. Yahuwah never accepts such mixing. And by the way, for anyone attempting to use this to say, see, the lost tribes did return to the land. One person does not in any way denote such. And there is nothing to say that he remained in that land after teaching them what he was to teach either. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, idols, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made. How many times does Scripture rail against these high places of paganism? Very many. Every nation in their cities wherein they dwell. And the men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth. We will find out whom she, yes, she is. And the men of Kuth made Nergal. And the men of Hamath made Ashima, we know who she is, and we'll cover her in more depth here. And the Avites, now that's a tribe we can follow, but not a good history, and you'll see, made Nibaz and Tartak. And the Sephirvites burnt their children in fire to Adrammolek and Anamolek, or Melek. In other words, Molek, Molek, Baal, and burning their children in the fire, very normal for worship of Baal and Molech. Moloch, however you want to say his name. It's in scripture a few different ways, but it's the same guy, same God. The gods of Sepharvaim. We will explore Sephar once again. These are the same as the previous territories we just read. So, we know exactly where they came from, and we already covered proof of such migrations of pagans into northern Israel in the previous video. These are the Assyrians who became the replacements. And see what they're doing. They're continuing their religion and trying to infuse Yahuwah into it. And again, we'll get more detailed on that. This is interesting, though, because it mentions three territories and two people groups in this passage. Why? Well, these two people groups are well attested and tell us much, and we'll get there. So let's break this down, because these gods are also identifiable. Sukkoth, or Sukkoth, Sukkot, tents, booths, Banath, from Babylon, is really the Chaldeans. Why? This is the Chaldee goddess Zerbanit, or Sarpanit, mother goddess. Now, we see that in most religions, the mother goddess, this ancient goddess who's worshipped certain ways, and she's associated 
pretty much the same in most religions. It's amazing. Even New Age religion worships Gaia, Mother Earth, who's really Mother Earth because she's the mother of the first Nephilim. Hmm. The Shining One. Who's that? Well, that is the actual definition of the word Nakash, which is used in Genesis for the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It is a reference to a seraphim angel, really. Harlot consort of Marduk. Sound familiar? Now, where are we? We're in Babylon. So, when prophecy tells us about the harlot of Babylon, is there really any guessing whom this is? Not at all. You're looking at her right now. Venus. Oh, you mean the planet in the constellation Virgo that some use to interpret Bible prophecy? No, thank you. Queen of the place, also queen of heaven, is what scripture records this goddess as as well. Not Mary, who is not born for another 600 years after Jeremiah wrote that. He certainly was referring to the pagan goddess, and he even says Yahuwah hates her, period. Creatress of seed, in other words, fertility goddess. Booth of the daughters. Sukoth, Sukot, Booths, that actually does fit. But Booth of Daughters is another reference to prostitution, to the harlot, because they had tents or booths, and that is where they would be visited. Worshipped via the rising moon. Who does that remind us of? Yep, this same goddess, same as Gamsu, Ishtar, or Ishtar is more appropriate pronunciation. And yes, that is on purpose. And or Belit. And take it into other countries and you will find this is the ancient goddess Isis, Semiramis, Aphrodite, Diana, Alet. And we could go on and on with the many pagan names for the same moon goddess of fertility. Because she is all over paganism and even in the Catholic Church, unfortunately. Other scholars assume that the name Sukoth Banath reflects both characters of the divine couple, so male and female. Okay, fine. Where the Sukoth part is a corruption of Marduk, and the Banoth part refers to Zermanit. Okay, fine. It makes sense. She's the consort or wife, lover of Marduk. So it does actually fit. Who is also known as Molech and Baal, Marduk is. So it does all tie. At the least, this is the ancient goddess that scripture is clear Yahuwah hates. And what are her symbols? Well, from a stella in Babylon, in the Marduk temple itself, a crescent moon, and the Zoroastrian phoenix, basically, and both are depicted often and consistently from ancient times to today. Nergal is the lion man, or really, the lion king. Yes, if you saw that cartoon, you are not watching a harmless account of an animated lion with human features, which would be called a Nephilim hybrid, and uh, not at all. But you are watching this guy, really. It's his story. He is the hero. Same title as the Nephilim, really, the mighty men of renown. He's the god of battle. That'd be Nephilim. Great brother and patron of hunting, which is a clear reference to Nimrod from Genesis 10, the mighty hunter before Yahuwah, according to Genesis 10. This is a Nephilim no matter how you slice it. Some say it's Gilgamesh, which works too. We say Nimrod because occult lore tells us they believe Nimrod had an apotheosis to heaven when he died and became Baal or Baal. So, also a reference to Baal. 
They may be different in symbol, but ultimately this is Baal, Marduk, Molech, etc. And his wife, thus far, is pretty much what we're seeing, the same god, same goddess. And you'll see that pattern continue. From the Avites, Nebaz, Nebo, Nabu, Nebas, Anu, from the Anunnaki, yes. Similar to Egypt, Anubis, note Anubis. Greek, Apollo and Mercury, depicted as a man with a dog or jackal head, which you've seen in Egyptian hieroglyphs very often, of course. Nimrud, or Nimrod, again, who became Baal. So the connection is right there. Tartak is depicted as a donkey, equated to Mars or Saturn. Hero of darkness. Well, that would be a Nephilim, a son of darkness. Just as the Dead Sea Scrolls, the War Scroll, identify the sons of darkness, hero of darkness, same thing. But even more telling here are the people themselves who were the Avites. Who are they? Avim, or Avites, also used to represent the name of the Hivites, the early inhabitants of the southern extremity of Canaan, afterward occupied by the Philistines. Okay, The Avim of Joshua 18.23 was a town of Benjamin, not a people, in other words, that doesn't really apply here because it's not what we're talking about. And certainly they didn't come from uh, the Benjamin into northern Israel. That is not these people. It's not the same thing. Jacenius supposes the name to mean dwellers in the desert. Now, Nephilim were well known to dwell in the desert and were called that oftentimes as well as mountain dwellers. But it was more probably the name of some pre-Semite tribe. The Avim are described as living in Katsurim, or encampments, and extending as far as the outskirts of Gaza. So, again, where is that? Philistia, the Philistines. Now we start to pull this together some. Deuteronomy chapter 2. As he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from before them, Horims were Nephilim, we'll show you, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. And the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, Hazarim, same as we just said, even unto Azah, the Kaphtarims, which came forth out of Kaftar, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. Now, the Kaftarim, we covered this before in the previous videos, are the same as the Gaftarim, which are Nephilim, the origin of the Philistines. Remember that from the Septuagint we already covered. The Gaftarim are from the Chasmonim, they are equated. From whence came the Philistines? So the Nephilim are tied to the Hasmoneans, as we proved before. Joshua 13 confirms this. From Sihor, which is before Egypt, even to the borders of Ekron, northward, which is counted to the Canaanite. Who were the Canaanites? Well, we know who they were because the spies were sent, and within them are Nephilim giants, for sure. But check this out. This is more specific than that. The five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites, and the Ashdadites, and the Eshkelonites, and the Gittites, and the Ekronites. Now, those are the five, but included and equated also the Avites. So it's lumped in with the five lords of the Philistines, the Avites are. All linked to the Gaftarim, the Hasmonim, from whence the Philistines came. The Nephilim, and this is the Hasmoneans who again were from Samaria, not from Judea, and were not Israelites. 
The next is a god and goddess combination again, leading to the same couple as the rest here. Adramilek and Anamilek of the Sefer Vayim, associated with the constellation Cepheus. Moloch, Mil Molech, Mi Moloch, same. So Baal, once again, by a different name. The Chaldean god, San. So again, still linked to the Chaldeans too. These guys are all affiliated, pretty much. This is the same religion. It may have a little different face. The gods may have a little different name in the different areas, just as they did in the days of Muhammad, in fact, uh, when he chose the Allah of Mecca, the chief god of Mecca, as Allah, uh, Hubal, the moon god, and all of the other gods, you know, he just abandoned, but that you can't erase them from history. They're still there. The shepherd and the sheep. Now, see, they counterfeit Bible narratives with these gods oftentimes. And you see even messianic symbology and even the virgin birth and many of those things. Those are counterfeits. Absolute counterfeits. Satan well knew that Yahusha would have to be born of a virgin in order to be what he was to be. So that is something that he copied. That's all. Known as or depicted as a horse peacock man, you see on the screen. That's an illustration, not, a, not anything in uh, hieroglyphs. But we do see the symbology, especially the peacock. And you're going to see that when we get to the Essenes, an abundant amount. So, again, though, what is that? That's a Nephilim hybrid, once again. Also known as the Peacock Angel. We've had some people ask about that. This is the Peacock Angel you're looking at right here. And this will reveal much. The children are burned in the fire in sacrifice to this god, Molech or Baal. The Assyrian Adar Malik, Adar is prince, or Anum Malik, Anu is prince. So Adar and Anu are well-known Assyrian gods, the Anunnaki, yes. So right back to Anu, the Anunnaki, and the sons of Anak, which are Nephilim in scripture. But this Guy is represented by peacock symbology, and that's really going to take us somewhere, you'll see. Now, many scholars attempt to locate the Sephar Vayim. Of course, they came from this general area, yes, of Assyria, but not necessarily one city, though, because this is not a location, but a reference to a people defined by their religion, Kabbalah, where they worship the Sephar, the Sephiro, that's Hebrew, for the tree of life, but not the real tree of life in the garden, which is still there, and they cannot access it, nor is it really a part of their worship, but instead the esoteric Sephiro, which really, if you break it down, actually fits the tree of the knowledge of good and evil far better than the actual tree of life. Let's vet that. Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical doctrine known as Kabbalah, is distinguished by its theory of ten creative forces that intervene between the infinite unknowable God, Ein Sof, and our created world. Now, this is very interesting. Many will say, well, that's not Judaism. Yes, it is. Kabbalah is taught in temples all over. Look into Chabad, and Chabad will spout Kabbalistic doctrine over and over if you read their stuff. And that is the largest of temples, for that matter, uh, at least when you put them all together. Through these powers, God created and rules the universe. Now, the word universe is not actually even a Bible word or a concept. Think about that. Yahuwah is never referred to in Scripture as the God of the universe. Yet you see that in Judaism very regularly. They worship this God of the universe. Well, who is that? Well, that's Ein Sof. 
We'll go into that more. And it is by influencing them that humans cause God to send to earth forces of compassion or severe judgment. Think about this now. Is Judaism really any different today? It defines its God as unknowable, untouchable. You can't even pronounce his name all for penalty of not being able to enter heaven even, as far as some rabbis are concerned, and we've covered that in detail before. Their God is Ein Sof, which means what? Well, Ein is Hebrew for I. Could also be spring or fountain, meaning the water that flows from the eye, which is but the actual root is I, in both cases actually. So it's I of soft would be potentially Greek, although we're going to show you a little different in the next slide. So I of wisdom. What's the I of wisdom? Well, now we're talking about the all-seeing I of Horus. You know, the one that appears in the Kabbalah hand right in the palm. It's all right there. Now, we will prove the Essenes actually fit this sect the best in coming videos. And yes, if you watch Star Trek, Spock was not rendering the priestly blessing of the Bible, which is never recorded as the Kabbalah hand, because it's the Kabbalah hand. Why are the fingers open? They're open in the center to indicate the eye in the center, because you don't draw an eye on your hand. That's how you indicate symbology, symbolo symbologically the eye in the center. And the Kabbalah hand, which has even become a fashion statement today, is worship of another god, Ein Sof. Bears his name and its meaning, even, really. It certainly is not worship of Yahuwah. So, if you see someone wearing that, they have no clue who Yahuwah is. They are worshiping a different god, even though they may not know it. Now, this goes back to Babylon. And really, this is Watcher Fallen Angel Religion. In origin, ultimately. See, Sephar in Sephar Vaim, or Sephar Vites, is a reference in Hebrew, and especially Kabbalah, as the tree of life, or Sephira, or Sephiro. Here are the different etymologies which lead to this, including Sof. So, Ein Sof is more specifically the eye of the Sephiroth. So far, tree of life. So the eye of the tree of life, the eye of the hand, they certainly include the eye in their worship. And not only do modern Essenes make this connection to Kabbalah themselves, I mean, we don't have to prove anything, they come right out and say it, Again, not all do. There's different factions, and just as all of the religion, it's been split and split and split and split. And, oh, well, we're not, you know, those guys because, well, we believe you don't wear a red hat on Tuesdays. Okay, whatever. You are the same religion, period. <laughs> and we just don't make such distinctions. Wait till we take you to what is termed the Essene find in Ein Gedi. Yes, Ein Gedi, 25 miles south of Qumran, not in Qumran, where not one piece of Essene archaeology has ever been found. But in Ein Gedi, this will blow your mind because it is so abundant and the symbology is right there. Even in the middle of their synagogue, they have the eye of the peacock, the symbol of the Nazis. I mean, it is going to blow your mind when we get there, and we are going to get to that, and we're going to bring all that out. It's amazing. This is not a community following Yahuwah in any sense, nor is it related in any way, shape, or form 
to the community of John the Baptist in Qumran. No. They were an infusion, just as we are seeing from the Samaritan replacements. No, they're not in Samaria, but we will still make that connection too. We already started to, because where did the Hasmoneans go? Well, they started in Modain, Asmodi, you know that, remember that part. They started in Modain, which is in Samaria, not Judea. And they come down into the wilderness, okay? Where did they go? They go into Ein Gedi. So they actually make that connection. And then afterwards, they even build a palace there or a, an estate, whatever you want to call it. So uh, again, Hasmoneans and Essenes right there in Ein Gedi. And it's a small area. There wasn't much else there. So yeah, pretty easy to put it all together. They were in infusion just as the Samaritans. But the difference, the Essenes began infiltrating Israel during the exodus from Egypt, and we'll prove that out. But still, they still originate in Persia, all the same. We'll show you. We have Ashima, who also connects to the Hasmoneans in a sense, but very directly to the Pharisees as it is their religion of modern rabbinic Judaism, whose root is Phariseeism. Same thing without the second temple rituals, of course, but otherwise exact same. Ashima is still the name of their god to this day. Hashem, same name, same root. I know we hear that just means the name in Hebrew. But no, it is the same root as Ashima, Hashema, Hashem, as we already showed you in the previous videos. Now, we've covered this, so we won't repeat, but let's expand this with a new definition. Similar to goddess Asherah. Now, we know her from scripture. She is the harlot of Babylon, Ashtaroth, also known as, goat, Lamb, man, or human. So part goat, part lamb, part human. Sounds a lot like Baphomet as well. Many of these gods and goddesses, by the way, have a male and female form, even though it's the same god and goddess in many cases. And there is evidence that angels can also appear in both forms. So the initial fallen angels were able to do that. The name, portion, or lot, Akkadian, goddess Shimti, which means fate. So the goddess of fate, who is known as the name, Hashem. See, this is not Yahuwah, not in any sense whatsoever. Hashem in Hebrew, long before Judaism was ever created, by the Pharisees, because they're the creators of Judaism. No, the Bible never identifies Yahuwah as having a religion called Judaism. So there is no ancient Judaism of the Bible and a modern Judaism of modern rabbinic Jews. No. Nonsense. That is a false paradigm. Now get this. It's the same root as the Arabian Kizma and the Turkish Kismet. Hmm. Oh my. Have you heard that word kismet? It's used in Yiddish, really, infused into modern Hebrew. But it's not Hebrew. It's Turkic and a reference to the god of fate, which is exactly what kismet means. Fate in Yiddish, or what they call modern Hebrew but it's actually Yiddish, Jiddish, Jewish, not ancient Hebrew. But this gets far worse. Read further. Asham Yahu. Ooh. Or really, Asham Yah. Ugh. And Asham Beth El. It's again, counterfeit. Trying to infuse Ashima and Yahu into one name. 
You're seeing that right here, are forms of her name. And a variant of her name is also attested in the Hebrew temple in elephant time in Egypt. So there's actual archaeology on this. There's a Hebrew temple in Egypt. Is that true? Huh. Is it really Yahuwah's? No, it's not. The divine name or epithet, Ashema Yahu, Hashema, see, there we go, Ashema, Hashema, it's the same word. Y-H-W-H, Yahu, Yaho, they use it different ways, which is attested in the papyri from the Yahweh temple of Elephantine. So they just mixed up his name as Yahu, Yaho, and Yahweh in the same exact sentence almost. Kind of ridiculous when you think about it. So in Egypt has been connected in both theme and structure with the title of Astarte, so Astarte is Ashima, Hashima, which appears in Ugardic text as Astarte, name of Baal. So this is also Baal. See, all of this stuff just, it infuses, it's one big melting pot is what they're trying to do here. And it is false religion at its core, and Yahuwah rejects it. He always has, and he always will. See how this reference keeps infusing Baal, Astarte, Ashima, and trying to infuse into that Yahoo, Yaho, Yahweh, YHWH with them. This is exactly what we are talking about. And exactly what Kings, 2 Kings 17, is identifying. Exactly. So you're reading this happened, and now you're seeing exactly how it happened. You cannot infuse Baal and Ashima with Yahuwah. Not in any way. And no way did any of Yahuwah's temples ever do such, period. And just when was this temple built in Egypt? Well, it makes one think perhaps by the Israelite slaves in the era of Moses, right? But no, that would be blatantly false. This is what the occult does. They try to melt in lies and mislead. So wait a minute. In Judaism, they pray to Hashem as a he, right? Well, let's just hear from Netanyahu himself and see what he has to say about whether they're God. Let's go on. Maybe well, maybe uh, God will show his hand. Well, you know, if you're Her Jew, hand. Yeah, if modern you're Israel sometime. worships a goddess named Hashem, Hashema. Remember, her symbol is an eight-pointed or six-pointed star, so it's really not that hard to track. No Israelite would ever accidentally use the star of Ishtar, yet that is the modern symbol for modern Israel. Ancient Israel was never known by a star. And David did not have one either. And the only two times a star is mentioned in the Bible, in Israelite worship, is they're pursuing other false gods like Remphan and Quan. See, we can track many of these by their god, and their symbols they continue to use even today. You cannot Christianize or Judaize an ancient symbol for the ancient goddess, that would be sheer stupidity. You just distance yourself from ever using such, period. But what about this supposed temple in Egypt? Was it really Yahuwah's temple? Or was it an Essene manipulation? Because Essenes are well recorded in Egypt, even in that area. And we'll cover that in detail. The Jews had their own temple to Yahweh, evincing polytheistic beliefs, really. Since when does Yahuwah allow mixing of other gods? Well, never. He hates that. Which functioned alongside that of Kanum, a pagan temple. Very nice. Excavation work done in 1967 reveals the remains of the Jewish colony centered on a small temple. The petition of Bagos is a letter written in 407 B.C. to Bagos, the Persian governor of Judea, appealing for assistance in rebuilding the Jewish temple in Elephantine. 
which had recently been badly damaged by an anti-Jewish rampage on the part of a segment of the Elephantine community. Now, last I checked, the Persian governor in Judea has nothing to do with the temple in Egypt in that era, but we'll hear them out. Now, our forefathers built this temple in the fortress of Elephantine back in the days of the kingdom of Egypt. And when Cambyses came to Egypt, he found it built. They, the Persians, knocked down all the temples of the gods of Egypt, but no one did any damage to this temple. Now, why would the Persians have destroyed every other temple in Egypt, Egypt except this one? Well, because it is centered around the worship of Ishtar and Baal, not Yahuwah. Because that is the Persian religion. It's the same thing. Why? Because this is an Essene site. We will prove out not one of Yahudim in any sense. The community also appealed for aid to Senbalat I a Samaritan potentate, and his sons, Deliah and Shelemiah. Now, those are Samaritans. Why would you go to Samaritans regarding the rebuilding of something that was something that belonged to Judea? It doesn't make any sense. Samaria is a totally separate nation serving different gods. There is no synergy there, yet they did. Why? Because this temple represented the Samaritan religion, not the one in Judea. Now, it does say, as well as Yohanan ben Eliashib. Now, he is the temple priest, but what you're going to find is he doesn't even respond. He doesn't support this. He doesn't do anything to support the rebuilding of this temple. But who does? Well, the Samaritans and the Persians. Hmm, imagine that. So, that tells you what this is. Sambalad is a Horite, in fact, which was a known Nephilim tribe, yet again. Imagine that. And appealing to Persia and Samaria makes zero sense unless you are propagating their religion, which this temple was an exact match to what the Assyrian replacements did in Samaria. The same infusion with Ashima, Ishtar, Baal, and trying, attempting to infuse Yahuwah into that, falsely so, and he rejected it then, and he rejects it now. There is nothing new about this. The temple priest in Judea never even responded according to history and did not support this whatsoever, and we'll review that next. If it was Yahuwah's temple, he certainly would have. Yes, there is a verse that in the last days, note the last days, an altar will be built in Egypt to Yahuwah, and that will happen. It has not yet. But remember, lost tribes are there as well from the southern kingdom in these days. However, not in the days that this temple was built. And they will erect such. But 400 B.C. is not the last days in any sense, and the temple was built long before that. There was a response of both governors, Bagos of Persia and Deliah from Samaria. Why? Because they served the same gods. It was their shared temple of their shared religion which gave the permission by decree to rebuild the temple, written in the form of a memorandum. A memorandum of what Bagoi and Deliah said to me, saying, memorandum, you may say in Egypt, to rebuild it on its site as it was formerly. By the middle of the 4th century B.C., the temple at Elephantine had ceased to function. There is evidence from excavations that the rebuilding and enlargement of the Kun or Kunum temple under Nectanebo II, 360 
B.C., took the place of the former temple of Yahuwah, they're saying. It wasn't his temple, but that's what they're saying. So the money was likely taken by the Egyptians, maybe, but no matter. This was never Yahuwah's temple. His temple was in Judea and never anywhere else on earth. Other than his heavenly temple, which has never ended and is the origin of the one in, well, really next to Jerusalem. But notice, too, who did not respond? Again, the temple priest in Jerusalem, no response, did not support it. Only the Persian and Samaritans, because this was the temple of their people and their religion, not Israelites. In 2004, the Brooklyn Museum of Art created a display entitled Jewish Life in Ancient Egypt, a family archive from the Nile Valley, which featured the interfaith couple of Ananiah, an official at the temple of Yahal, now they spell it differently yet again, uh, aka Yahweh, and his wife Tamut, who was previously an Egyptian slave owned by a Jewish master, Meshulam. Some, see, this is all mixing, but let's hear them out. Some related exhibition didactics of 2002 included comments about significant structural similarities between Judaism and the ancient Egyptian religion. Well, there's a reason for that. They are the same in many ways. And how they easily coexisted, oh, so nice they coexisted, and blended at Elephantine. Again, Yahuwah does not allow blending or mixing of any sort, period. Doesn't happen, no way. Now, if it does happen, it's not him. That's it. We know that. Because he rebukes it many times over, and even Israelites did, in fact, do the same in worshiping Baal, although there's no evidence of them ever worshiping Baal in the temple or anything like that. That's just not there. So, they didn't mix in Yahuwah. They worshiped Baal. They went whoring after other gods. Yes, they did. Not all, but some. He does not coexist with any other religion. He hates such, and he says so many times. All of his word is about relationship with him, not religion anyway. Notice, too, the inconsistencies in this article as to the rendering of the name of God. Yahweh, Yaho, Yahoah. It, it, it just several different inconsistencies. They can't even seem to render the name one singular way in the same article, which is nonsense. Neither is accurate. It is Yahuwah, and we prove that in the Name of God series. If you haven't seen it, check it out. But here's the biggest problem. It is inferred in this article that this temple may actually have been built by Hebrews in the era of Moses, perhaps. Now, let's shut that down. The Book of Jubilees provides a solid timeline for the beginning of the Exodus as it does with many things, because that is its purpose. It's the book of jubilees, of times and seasons, and even directions. The division book of the division is another name for it, because it's when Noah divided the earth, not because it divides people groups, no. And it ties with Genesis very, very closely. We vetted it fully, and we're going to release a video on that in time. Israel lived where... In Egypt. I mean, what part of Egypt did they live in? Did they live in Elephantine? Is that recorded anywhere? Because we're not finding it. All of Israel lived in the land of Goshen, found in the fertile crescent of the Nile in the north. Satan was bound on day 14 of Nisan, the month of Passover, the first month of the year, on the accurate Hebrew calendar. And this allowed the Israelites to request gold and resources from the Egyptians, and it kept Pharaoh at bay as well, 
and allowed him to acquiesce to Moses' final demand to let Israel go, which he did. The Israelites then take their journey. Now they meet at Sukkoth, or Sukkot, booths is the area, in the upper right. Now, Satan is bound only five days and loosed on the 19th, in which he then convinces Pharaoh to set off after the Israelites. And that was the reason for that pause, by the way. And that's all recorded in Jubilees very well. Major problem with Hebrews living in elephant time, elephant time, it's a seven-day journey to Sukkoth. The departure point, and they only had five days to get there for a seven-day journey, and if it's a large number of people, it's going to take longer than that. So if that, as Israel was likely already well gone for two to three days already at that point, so the answer is no, Hebrews were not in Elephantine, no. That temple was a new pagan temple, not one of the Israelites. Again, an Essene manipulation meant to confuse, and they sought approval from their own people, who all served the same religion and the same gods. Back to 2 Kings, and this will bring this home. Who were these Samaritan priests that were chosen? This is interesting. So they feared the Lord, Yahuwah, and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places. Wait, who are the lowest in the land? Well, not the poor. Many would probably answer that, but that wouldn't be the case. No. No, the very lowest, the ones with the least amount of rights and completely poor, technically, would be the criminals. And this is why we see that behavior continue among this fold even today, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord, Yahuwah, so they feared him, in other words, they were afraid of him, really, and served their own gods. So again, infusion, after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. Unto this day, which is about 650 to 350 B.C., roughly. They do after the former manners. They fear not the Lord, Yahuwah, so they're not worshiping him. Neither do they after their statutes, so they're not following his statutes, or after their ordinances. They're not following his ordinances, or after the law and commandments. They're not following his law and commandments which the Lord Yahuwah commanded the children of Jacob, which they are not, whom he named Israel, but they are not. But they say they are, and they do lie. They are the synagogue of Satan, pinpointed in Revelation 2.9 and 3.9. So, this is a people who infuse Yahuwah into their religion, but they do not actually keep his commandments, laws, and statutes, and they are not Israel. Messiah really brought this completely into full context when he describes the synagogue of Satan and he describes the Pharisees that their traditions are against his commandments and that when they get a hold of the Torah, they make it, because they expand it with their leaven, they make it of none effect. That is the same people. So we will find both of these things following them as a people in Scripture, and we do, and we'll show you. Now he sums it all up, as Scripture does so often, so brilliantly, much better than we ever could. Howbeit, they did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So they didn't change, they just appear to on the surface. Get that? Sound familiar? Indeed it does. So these nations feared the Lord, Yahuwah, and served their graven images. They are mixing, infusing. Both their children, 
and their children's children. So they did this for generations. As did their fathers. So do they unto this day. So the generations continue, yet they still worship their gods, even though they slap Yahuwah's name on it, sort of, and not really completely, but sort of. It's just kind of there. He's really not in the religion because he would never allow it. Now, this basically takes us all the way up until the days of the Hasmonean Revolt because these are the priests who attacked Judea and took over the temple and they continued their Babylonian banking system of criminals right on the steps of the temple, even running a pawn shop right there as criminals would. Yahusha turned those tables over and hello, they are every, on every street corner still today. They're called banks, and still some follow the old scheme of the pawn shop even. But it's all the same system, and it originates in Babylon. And how did it get into Israel? Through Samaria. It was brought into Samaria and then into Judea. And today, it's all over the world and even has a new form in the Central Bank and the World Bank and the IMF. All the very same Pharisees. There is nothing new under the sun. So let's wrap this up. As this is a good breaking point, these Samaritan replacements worshipped five or six gods who actually served to help identify them, even today. Essentially, they are Baal, also known as Molech, Nimrod, Anu, Apollo, Mercury, Mars, Saturn. They're all the same. Then you have the ancient goddess, known as Istar, Asherah, Astarte, Isis, etc. Essentially, we can tie them to the Essenes, which we will do. Nephilim worshippers, Nephilim themselves, Pharisees and Sadducees and Hasmoneans, all, really. This whole system fits the pantheon and not the Bible. This is why Yahushua railed against it during his ministry, and we will go there next. These are the Psalm 83 enemies, and we are only getting started in this series still. For those who come into this video and think you have enough information to debate us on the lost tribes and whom Israel is, you are missing over at least 25 videos of context. So don't waste your time and ours with such debate from a position of ignorance. Go back and watch, and you will find Scripture fully identifies the lost tribes of Israel by three regions and neither fit the Psalm 83 enemies at all. We aren't speculating, but have been on this journey to prove this topic out thoroughly, and you have no basis by which to debate us with Scripture fragments, which we likely already cover in previous videos. Watch the series, test it, and learn, and even challenge, that's fine, if you're challenging from the basis of actually having watched the case. If you haven't reviewed the case, you have no right to challenge. However, we will shut down challenges based on one video because one video is not our case, 25 plus R. We aren't going to remake our videos and comments, which is really what you're asking us to do, to appease basically laziness of wishing to debate without even reviewing our position. You would never do that in an actual debate, so don't do that here. The next video will follow this soon. Thank you for watching our Lost Tribes series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell or just click the next screen. Share this video with others and check out our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah bless and on our 
coming conferences in the Philippines, May 2019, we offer our updated schedule next as we have added Visayas now with more still working. This will be quite a month and only the beginning. We are so excited. As our schedule continues to grow for May 2019, we would like to take a moment and thank all those who are praying for these upcoming conferences in the Philippines and all those who have given to support the effort on Patreon. It is so helpful to have your support going into the schedule and future conferences. We can't wait to get out and meet many of you and deliver the message of Solomon's Gold series to many who have never watched the videos even. This will be a process, but this is a great start beyond our expectations. Around 15 dates are booked now, and what a month this will be. But it will not end there, so if you cannot make a conference, there will be more to come, hopefully for many years. We have had so many step up on so many levels, even some taking on full event responsibility. And thank you to all our hosts who are working so hard to prepare. We also want to thank our partner, Pastor Paul Madrano, who has done so much to make these events a reality. We love you, Pastor Paul and Susan. It's getting close now, and if you feel led, there will be a link on the next screen that you can click and give to support these conferences still. This is not merely an effort of the God culture, but so, so many. And thank you all so much. The Philippines is truly rising. Rise, Sheba, Ophir, and Tarshish. Rise. Yahuwah bless all.